Good afternoon. Welcome back to another edition of NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinars. For those tuning in for the first time, our Industry Essentials webinar series is our premier digital educational platform featuring a variety of interactive programming, all designed to provide you timely, engaging, and essential education when and where you need it most. I'm Brian Gilbert, the Deputy Director of Events here at NCIA, and as always, I'm thrilled to kick off another episode of our premier member-driven educational experience with this new episode inside of our Catalyst Conversation series today. Each of those are intentionally designed to give enrollees in our Social Equity Scholarship Program in particular the opportunity to network and gain access to valuable knowledge that will help them excel within the cannabis industry. In today's webinar, members of NCIA's Education Committee and Health Equity Working Group will be joined by members of San Francisco's Office of Cannabis, the City College of San Francisco, and Green Enterprise HBCU College to Careers Tour to share their experiences, lessons learned, and best practices while highlighting the importance of collaboration in creating holistic educational ecosystems. If you're looking to make a positive impact and build a successful cannabis business, you're in luck as today you'll discover the power of dynamic and intentional ecosystems that maximize the general operation opportunities in the cannabis industry. So sit back and settle in for an engaging and insightful conversation that we hope will leave you with elevated ideas, a deeper understanding and a strong network to achieve the impact you desire. All right, enough with the intro. Let's get on. Uh, let's get this show on the road. Kick things off, I'd like to welcome back our moderator for today's program and all of our Catalyst Conversation series, Mike Lamuto, NCIA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager to the virtual stage. Great to see you here virtually, Mike. Um, with that, I'll turn it right over to you to lead the panel through some more formal introductions of themselves in today's topic and get going from there. Hey, Brian, I appreciate you. I appreciate all our panelists joining us today. Uh, you know, today's conversation, I think, is a very important one. Um, and, you know, one of the purposes of the Catalyst conversation is to bring folks together to have these kinds of conversations. And then, uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll go ahead, we'll take these recordings, and we'll make sure we distribute these to our education committee, to other educational leaders around the country, as well as to some of the regulators that we're connected with around the countries that look to us for information and for leadership on topics like this. Uh, so, you know, without further ado, um, I want to welcome everybody to the stage here today. Uh, I will let them introduce themselves, of course, in a minute here. Uh, before I do, just to uh, recap what it is that we're going to be talking about today, it's really about creating educational ecosystems, right? And so, you know, we hear all the time, we talk all the time, cannabis, about education being key, right? Education being important, how education is something that is constantly evolving in our industry. And if you don't get on the bandwagon with understanding the different educational opportunities that you can, you can get left behind. At the same time, we have to recognize that it takes an ecosystem to create an education, uh, educational pathways and proper, um, you know, proper platforms in order to be able to drive the industry forward. Uh, so especially when we're talking about doing so in an equitable fashion. Uh, so today uh, we have uh, some great speakers today uh, that we're going to basically be talking about all the different pieces and how we how we plug together all the different offerings that these different institutions have been able to pull together. Uh, and so we'll start out, I'm gonna um, go ahead and we'll go around the table. And the question that we have for everybody here, of course, is aside from you know your name and what organization you're representing or institution you're representing, uh, why this is an important conversation to you in the first place and what brought you out here today. So we'll start here with uh, Jay uh, from uh, City College of San Francisco. Uh, what, what, you know, welcome to the show, welcome to the, the webinar today. Thanks. So my name is Jay Doggart Carlin. I use they, them pronouns, and I am the Dean of Social Sciences, Behavioral Sciences, Ethnic Studies, and Social Justice, which is a very long title um, at City College of San Francisco. And I am one of the co-originators of the United States first um, associate's degrees in cannabis studies. And our degree, and I'll just say it real quick, was really we decided to develop a degree that looks at the complex biopsychosocial relationship of humans to cannabis in multiple cultural and institutional and interpersonal context. And um, we're really focusing on our major looks at the social construction of cannabis as a product, as a psychoactive substance, as a behavior, as a form of deviance, as a form of revolution, as a form of spirituality, of medicine, all depending on the cultural standpoint, the time, the global location. And we use a social justice framework to analyze public policy, our rhetoric around cannabis, um, and we looked at the criminal justice system and all those things. And, and this is how we developed our degree. So we went beyond looking at cannabis just as a business um, and as something as a social phenomenon. So we developed our degree a couple of years ago and I'm just super excited to be part of the conversation 
talking about cannabis education. So we also developed um, a work to developing a, um, to our extension, a program where we're also doing then training for people who want to work in the cannabis industry. And we think both things are important. So on those job training skills, talking about things from taxation to finance to to, to what you work, and then also looking at things like cannabis as an idea and a social phenomenon and not separating it, not decontextualizing it from the social equity piece. So right. I could talk about this all day long. Oh, absolutely. And uh, uh, Sharon, uh, you know, welcome. Uh, really glad to have you here and all the work that you're doing. Could you please introduce yourself and tell us why you're here? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. And I'm glad to be here uh, among so many great panelists. And I'm looking forward to this conversation with everyone. I'm Sharon Perry Thomas. I am here in Philadelphia. I am the founder of Black Cannabis Week, as well as DACO, which is the Diasporic Alliance for Cannabis Opportunities. And my role is a social impact director. And so when I think about cannabis, I think about the positive impact that this sector could actually make in our communities, but we need to make sure that we have people in place who are part of the workforce, who are part of the executive teams, who are uh, part of this role to really make this industry what it needs to be to benefit the communities, particularly the communities that have been impacted. And that journey has taken me to father my education, which um, is actually one of the first universities, University of the Sciences, which is the first pharmaceutical school in this nation. And, and also where the first uh, cannabis PhD uh, is held, uh, which is the University of Sciences. And there, they started a, a master's in pharmaceutical health here with a concentration in cannabis. So our class was the first class and we just graduated about three weeks ago. So when we talk about education, uh, more than just talk, but it's, it's definitely about you know, doing the walk. And so I really believe that education is a way um, and just really you know, fusing the traditional along with what is current to make this go farther into the future for us all. So I'm looking forward uh, to hearing more about uh, how we can all contribute to our communities along this educational spectrum. Awesome, thank you, Sharon. Congratulations, uh, that's really awesome. Um, you know, and I hear the word first come up a lot in what you're saying, as well as in a lot of these kinds of conversations. We're in cannabis and we're starting, you know, a regulated industry here. Uh, Kevin, if you're there with us, um, you know, uh, you guys uh, at the Cleveland School of Cannabis, uh, you know, I'll let you introduce yourself because I think you got you also have some great news uh, as well. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Kevin Green, the vice president of Cleveland School of Cannabis. Uh, we are a educational uh, cannabis ed institution uh, that solely focuses on cannabis content. Uh, when we started back in 2016, our goal uh, is to foster uh, the new um, entry-level workforce for the cannabis industry. Uh, we really felt that what we wanted to do was to be able to uh, validate individuals that were coming from the legacy market into the uh, now traditional uh, market that we have here now. Um, take individuals that might have been advocates about cannabis or users from cannabis or their own um, education that they put together that they felt they knew about cannabis to be able to work in the industry. Um, and then the third uh, demographic I think is the most important, individuals that deserve access to good quality jobs that have upward mobility. Uh, you don't have to be an advocate or a user of cannabis to have a quality job uh, that has access that doesn't, that won't um, always take, especially in this industry, always take you to get a high degree level and being able to get into the workforce uh, with that situation. Uh, so our focus has always been about high standards. Uh, in 2018, we received uh, a state approval by the Ohio Board of Career Schools and Colleges, which made us our second state approved school for cannabis education solely. And now we're on the process of accreditation uh, through Middle States Association um, and commission for elementary and secondary and secondary schools. So quite of a mouth mouthful um, in their setup there. But uh, what that really does for us and uh, what I really think does for the industry, um, it continues to raise the bar 
as the other institutions that are on this call as well in our traditional institutions uh, that have continued to, you know, some that have continued uh, to take the step to get into the cannabis education space on many, many different levels. This allows us uh, to be a cannabis institution uh, that uh, will be have a accreditation that's recognized by the United States Department of Education. Um, and for us, you know, that is uh, one of those situations where we feel uh, that this is another step in uh, not the validation, but the respect um, of the cannabis industry, where not only that the current individuals that have uh, put so much time in uh, really go ahead and really get their return on investment, uh, but truthfully, all of the other great minds that are coming up in the world right now that are on the fence and saying, does this industry make sense for me? Um, is it something you know that I should commit to? And I'm hoping that what you know we're doing at CSC and all the other educators that are on this call uh, makes it a big yes for them because uh, we're going to need the great young minds of the world to come into the industry and take it serious to help us uh, evolve this thing. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you for all the legwork you all have been doing because I 100% agree with you as far as elevating the the validity and the respect of the industry. Um, you know, so shifting from the three our three representatives from three different institutions across the country, um, educationally speaking, uh, Nurse Tony, uh, could you please introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I am Tony, fondly called Nurse Tony, and I work. Um, I'm a wellness brand in my business. We our goal is to highlight wellness in the plant from organizations within the cannabis industry and outside. And I do believe um, working with businesses that you must start from the community upward. So my focus on preventative wellness for youth and education and stigma removal and health and wellness for aging populations, but really taking the education to the street level because there are some who want to um, gain more knowledge in programming, and there's others that are going to be residing in the communities, potentially caregivers or children of caregivers that need the basic knowledge. And when we talk about continuing education in these wonderful programs um, that everyone spoke about, we want to make sure that that education is something that they grow into. When we all were in school, you knew you completed the next grade, the next grade. But as we bring out these um, institutions that focus on education and cannabis, we need to be in the community letting the community as a whole know that these exist versus just um, folks that are currently in the industry or newly entering. This, this affects the end user first. So everything we are doing, um, I'm here to make sure that we don't lose sight of that and really gain more sight to that and the importance of really um, tackling the community first. I am a new um, host of a wellness program to do exactly that on KGL TV, I'm streaming out of Canada. And with June being um, Men's Health Month, it is a priority that we focus on men, but Black men specifically. So each one of my guests this month is a Black man in or outside of the industry, really speaking on wellness, not only of the plant, but inclusive of the plant. So again, beginning to have those conversations to start lightly removing stigma and educating folks wherever they fall um, in this space, because we're all in it, um, participating or not. Right. And so you know, before we get to Jeremy here, uh, you know, what I'm hearing from the four of you that have uh, introduced yourself so far is exactly what we talked about at the top of this hour, right? The ecosystem that it really takes, right? We're talking about all different aspects of education. We're talking about, uh, you know, the junior colleges, you know, San Francisco, City College of San Francisco, uh, a longstanding institution. We're talking about Cleveland School of Cannabis, a new institution that focuses just on cannabis. We're talking about, you know, the Masters of Science program uh, that, 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 you know, Sharon is talking about here at a longstanding institution also, uh, you know, in the pharmaceutical studies, right? Um, so, you know, and then Tony, you're bridging the gap there between what it takes to be at those levels, right? At all those different levels, the, the professional education, uh, business development, all these kinds of things, and then right into the community, right? And that we need to create all these different aspects. I know you're also uh, sitting on the education committee at the NCA, where that committee focuses on tying a lot of these dots together as well. Uh, another piece of this educational ecosystem that I think is very important is uh, the regulators, right? The regulatory agencies in these different cities that sometimes work with uh, organizations and institutions and, you know, kind of tie a lot of these pieces together. Jeremy, you're coming in from Office of, San Office of Cannabis in San Francisco. Could you please introduce yourself and kind of, you know, the role that your organization plays in this ecosystem? 
Good afternoon from not so sunny San Francisco. Jeremy Schwartz, Deputy Director, San Francisco Office of Cannabis, the Permitting and Regulatory Authority for Cannabis in the City. Uh, thank you, Mike, Brian, and CIA, uh, fellow panelists and the audience tuning in. The San Francisco Office of Cannabis uh, permits the commercial cannabis industry, plant touching businesses. Um, it's also uh, administers millions of dollars in grants awards, combats against predatory practices when it comes to operating agreements, bylaws, standing up technical assistance opportunities as well um, to augment some of the businesses. Um, why is something like this so important to, to Mike's point, really hammering the ecosystem here? I was fortunate enough to meet Brian about six years ago as a chapter leader for Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Uh, pre-California legalization. And what it showed me over those years is how important it is to bring folks together. Um, there's a disproportionate power imbalance in this space. Um, realizing social equity continues to be an uphill battle, uh, which makes it more important than ever for passionate folks in this space to come together to really problem sol solve and advance really good um, public policy outcomes as well as goals. Thank you. Awesome. No, thank you, Jeremy. Um, you know, so coming back over here to Jay, uh, one of the questions that I have for you regarding this ecosystem that's being created, you know, I know City College of San Francisco has been a leader in the space for a little while. Uh, you all have uh, a couple different levels that you engage with students, right? You have the, um, you have the, 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 the continuing education side of things. You also, I believe, recently received an award for uh, entrepreneurship in cannabis uh, as well. Uh, maybe I'm mis misquoting that. And then you also have an actual AA. So can you tell us kind of what the different levels of how City College engages with students? Sure, I, I, I misquoted a little bit, although you made my heart sing because that's certainly a future goal for us. So we have our extension. Most schools have an extension kind of program, which is not for credit classes and workshops that people can take that we've uh, building and is become quite robust. And we've worked with the industry to find out like, what do you need students? What do you need your new workers to know? And we've created a badging program that you can come in and do short term workshops on financing, on um, making tinctures, on culinary, on these kinds of things in the field that they can come take workshops that may be two or three days that may go over a couple of weeks and that we've really been interfacing with the industry to find out what do you need your folks to learn let us be the people that help teach teach that and then we get to bring in people from uh from the field people that are really out there working who may not meet the standards um of being a professor at a college right but are there doing the work every single day they can come in and be the experts i've attended some of those classes and trainings they're amazing these are the people that really know the business um, we've also brought in some cannabis lawyers from the area that can talk about all these how to do um, the track and tracing uh, software that you have to do in California. Like, how do you do that? And we can provide those kinds of things. So that's at our extension level. And then you move up to the AA and, level. But, you know, before you get into that, I, I actually wanted to uh, direct back to, to, to Kevin, because Kevin, it, this sounds similar to some of the things that you guys do with Cleveland School of Cannabis. Is that correct? Uh, yes. So when we, uh, yes, both end, right? So I always like to talk about both end, right? So it's, uh, for us, what we really lined up with is thinking about our kind of North Star was jobs. We said, what was the, you know, get, greatest way that we can get jobs now? You know, when she uh, spoke about like seminars and different um, kind of a point of context, again, as you know, every student is in a different point of their life. Every student is in a different need and availability. Uh, so for us, we have, you know, we used to have weekend programs as well as even online live free classes to our asynchronous program, to our most robust program, which is, you know, 150 clock hours or 300 clock hours where you're going to school a few times a week, you know, over a six month period um, within that situation, line up with different educational tracks that match the industry from cultivation to extraction, hemp and CBD, medical applications, which is research. Um, and I'm, I'm missing one uh, there, I said extraction and uh, dispensary operations. Uh, so we looked at the industry and we said, where are the gaps? Where are the biggest needs? Um, and then how do we career track individuals in there? 
Um, and then our executive program, you know, encompasses all of those educational tracks where we see that individuals now, because, you know, there's a lot of consolidation in our industry, depending on where you fall, that's a good or bad thing, right? You know, that's a, that's another seminar. Um, but with consolidation, we have organizations that not only have upward mobility because of their growth, but they're vertically integrated. So if you're someone that's looking for growth and you take um, uh, our executive program, you then have the ability to say, well, I started in you know, cultivation, but I took some stuff around extractions. That's a growth area for me. So when we talk about upward mobility, that's what I love about the industry because I just do the math, you know, and I did my own math at school. I did them and what was my opportunities coming out and what was salaries and the ways to move up compared to what I've done, seen students do. Um, you know, so I think on both programs, it's all about meeting the students where they are and setting them up for success, right? That flexibility, I think, is something you need in any industry, but especially in the industry that tells you, hey, tomorrow things have changed um, and this is what it is now. So I know both of our programs try to do our best to be as flexible as we can, where in education, traditionally, it's not that flexible. Um, right. So it, it is always a challenge to stay on top of that. Right. No, I think that those are two key takeaways I've had from conversations with both of you about what CSC is doing and what CCSF is doing, which is meeting the students where they're at and helping with that workforce development, the executive development. Uh, and Jay, you were about to talk about the AA program, which is kind of a, on, a, on the other yeah. side of things almost. Yeah. Well, I wanted to say sometimes our students have started in our workshops, right, our extension workshops, and then rolled into our degree because they come in and they're like, look, I just want to learn how to do these things to work in the profession at this level. And like what Kevin was saying, then they sort of see themselves as going, wait a minute, I can go farther in this. I can become someone who's a thought leader in this through public policy, or I want to start my own business. And I really need grounding in this much larger idea of looking at cannabis as a concept and not in that, you know, just as a product, right? And then they're beginning to get like, understanding the history of this, understand the worldwide perspective. We have an anthropology class that looks at this from biblical times till today, you know, and understanding all that. Suddenly it all starts to connect why this larger education of cannabis is actually gonna help you in your career. And so we see students that come in sometimes at the, I'm gonna do a thing on how to do bud tending. And then they're gonna, then suddenly they realize I'm going to be a college student in this. There's a path for me here. I get calls from parents sometimes even who are like, my kid is really into weed. And suddenly they say they can have a career in this. Is that really true? And I'm like, absolutely. And they could become a researcher. They can go to UC Berkeley. They can go to UC Davis. They can go and become this Humboldt has just started Humboldt. Um, Cal Poly Humboldt has just started their own cannabis program. You know, there's a lot of opportunities. So Anyway, and also to say this, because we're a community college in California and the way that city college is set up, we're actually free. So if you've lived in San Francisco for a year and a day, you can attend city college and you can attend these classes for free. So just want to throw that out there. It's something that we've worked really hard at. So our AA degree then is something that students can come into and along with their GE requirements, then they can transfer. There's not, a, Cal Poly has a direct transfer for us now, but they can also transfer into one of the other behavioral sciences and go be in sociology and study cannabis in that way or anthropology and study it that way, psychology and study it that way. Um, so we're also looking at working with other schools. We also have transfer agreements with H HBCUs that maybe you want to develop trans uh, cannabis programs. We, we want to find ways for students to continue studying this at the four-year level. When you said about entrepreneurship, and, I'll, and I, I want to go through, I want to give other people a chance to talk, but we have an award-winning entrepreneurship program at City College. We're still working at moving that into the cannabis industry. That's our next step. We always said that it's a three-legged table. And one was extension, two was the degree, and three was our entrepreneurship. And that's where we are right now is developing that piece. So um, thanks for giving a shout out to that. But we're not yeah, quite no. there yet. We're not quite uh, there. Absolutely. Well, soon enough, it will be. The next time we do one of these, it, it will be there. And again, it shows this, you know, the, the multi light stool that, that you're working on there, that Kevin's working on. Uh, Sharon, you know, we actually met uh, through uh, the, the HBCU uh, initiative that you were working on um, with uh, mm -hmm. Andrew Ferrier um, in Green Enterprise. And, you know, Jay here mentioned the uh, the TAG agreement that allows City College students to transfer to HBCUs. Um, but, you know, I, I know you learned a lot from the experience of doing this tour on the different campuses around the country with the HBCUs. Can you tell us a little about kind of like what the impetus behind that was and what some of the lessons that you learned there, uh, you know, in, in, dealing, in, in navigating the HBCUs in cannabis? Right. Yeah. So that was our 
college to career initiative and we visited about uh, at least three HBCUs and two, um, two other colleges that were predominantly um, African-American and people of color. And that was really important for us. And the HBCU part was really important because of where they were located. Most of these schools that we went to were located in the South. And you may say, well, why the South? You live in, in Pennsylvania, you're in the Northeast. Why I go down? Well, first of all, I'm originally from Memphis. So I love the South period. But most importantly, when you look at land ownership, the block of land ownership amongst uh, Black Americans is in the South. And so when we talk about just this, you know, this whole um, industry of cannabis, one of the things that you need is land. So just starting off there with going to the HBCUs for this, one of the things that we realized when we went there is that many of these students, um, some who were very familiar with cannabis, but not familiar at all with the educational opportunities in cannabis, even with having programs on their college campuses. Uh, one of the programs we went to, which was FAMU, their, um, which is in Florida, their agricultural department um, had a cannabis track. And uh, one of the others that we went to, which was Southern University, which is the, um, to my knowledge, the only HBCU with a, a facility. So their, their growth facility is their uh, state's medical marijuana facility. So if you live there in Louisiana, nine times out of 10, well, actually it's 50-50, it's two institutions, Southern University happens to be one. And so your cannabis is coming from an HBCU. Now, how did it get to that point? Well, first of all, someone who came from a um, from a legalized state went down and really helped to educate people about this industry. And that's what we need, particularly, I would say, you know, most familiar with the Black community. There's still a lot of stigma amongst, um, you know, amongst the community around cannabis. You say cannabis, you might as well say you're a dragon. Uh, and you're spitting that fire. And so for most of us, um, it's our, our duty and our role to present in a way that folks will really understand what this is and what the opportunities may be for our communities. And so just presenting this in a professional manner, again, on a college campus um, with the college presidents, there, it kind of gives the audience a little bit of room to say, well, maybe let me look at this. And that's really all that I think most of us are, are asking, you know, when we talk about education, forget about all the other stuff that you heard, all the news, all the bad things, and just really be open to understand that there are opportunities to be had here. And so that's what I think we all are here for. No, I appreciate you sharing all that. And, and it comes back again to what we talked about, again, top of the hour here, the legitimization of cannabis. A lot of it's going to have to come through education, through institutions stepping in and saying, we're going to legitimize it by having an AA degree at City College of San Francisco that now has evolved into a degree program at, at uh, you know, Humboldt Cal Poly, uh, having the Cleveland School of Cannabis go through the accreditation process and being recognized uh, hopefully soon by the you know, U.S. Department of Education. Um, and so, you know, these all pieces tie together. Um, the question I have for, for Jeremy and then also Nurse Tony here, because you two are, you know, kind of um, straddling the line here, right? Uh, so, so Jeremy, um, you know, how, do you, how does the city, you know, the, the city of San Francisco, the Office of Cannabis, uh, you know, uh, Office of Cannabis, right, in San Francisco, that's what you guys call it. Um, how do you plug in with City College uh, specifically, and do you envision there being, like, further relationships with you guys as you move down the line? Uh, that's a great question, Mike, um, especially playing matchmaker. So uh, uh, a lot of things are fluid, right? We, we iterate over time. The needs of the industry today aren't necessarily the needs of the industry tomorrow, four months from now, so on and so forth. Uh, so we've taken steps to uh, fund 
certain educational programs, there's still opportunities to strengthen relationships with other educational institutions to be a little bit more concrete. Um, in the past, we've partnered with places like Oaksterdam, the success centers, places like that to provide one-on-one -on -one training for, for skills, whether someone wants to be a cultivator or manage a business. Um, so to that end, and what we're doing here is to strengthen those relationships because a lot of opportunities are in certain windows of time. Um, so by connecting here and having ongoing dialogue really helps us to be able to, to seize those opportunities as they come. Um, so always interested to hearing what is what are the needs in the space. So for example, as places get permitted, uh, conflict resolution and mediation are becoming a, a growing skill set in the space from what I can see. But excellent question, Mike. Right, and what I can see with that is, you know, you might have the the ability, uh, like you said, very timely, right? So you might work with, say, the success centers. Uh, shout out to them, Angela White, doing amazing things there in San Francisco. Um, you know, you may be able to work with them on a conflict resolution, uh, you know, panel or workshop or something like that. But then that can eventually be trickled up towards the city colleges or the Cleveland Schools of Cannabis to be something that gets incorporated into their curriculum because you realize that's something coming down the pipeline that more more people are going to have issues with. Uh, Tony, how do we make sure that all of this does connect with the community? As Sharon just mentioned, folks that are even at their own schools don't even always recognize what's happening at their own schools. Like how do folks in the community who aren't even necessarily at these schools, how, how do we connect with them to make sure that they're also aware of the different educational opportunities for this industry? That's a great question. And um, piggyback, and we'll just adding to what both Jeremy and Sharon said. Um, so we have the education, right? But we, re we really need to start a, a level lower than the college student, because just like we have college fairs, career fairs, we need the industry to be out there um, in a, a career fair fashion, if that's what we're talking about, and educating anyone who may be interested. And I think a plug-in with the many dispensaries that are opening up, that's a good plug-in. Reaching out to stakeholders in your community, like your religious leader, your political leaders, and there are PTA groups, you know, really diving in and asking what they need instead of assuming. Because as we build programs, it's under the assumption of what we think um, community in nine times out of 10, with, not, with no ill will, we look at ourselves as, oh, the community like, like me would need. No, it's a little deeper than that. The community that is really stigmatized, the community that these dispensaries are opening up in, these wonderful opportunities for them to learn and grow are coming, but we need to step down one more. And I don't mean that in any way, but reach back. Let me say this, reach back one more and start the education there. And you got to build relationships with your stakeholders in these communities, building relationships between them and your dispensary owners. And then all of this wonderful education that's being created that can be disseminated that way and it's exciting for a, a eighth grader or a 12th grader that even imagine a career in cannabis and not heavy by stigma because where they live where they reside where their aunties and uncles and parents shop the education is being provided to help remove stigma and gain education so I think that's how we bridge that gap um, we're I feel like it, as an industry and 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 you know just being honest we're not there yet, and that's unfortunate because we missed that mark. That's where we should be beginning. You cannot build a home from the roof down, okay? You got to start from the soil up. Right. No, I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I'll use this opportunity to kind of uh, talk a little bit about the equity workshop tour and what we just did here at NCAA, which I think is something that helps to plug some of the gaps that you're talking about, right? Um, so the equity workshop tour, for, for those of you that don't know, uh, what it is, is we basically went to four different cities, Chicago, Detroit, New York, and uh, we did Brooklyn, and then Jersey City in New Jersey. And we're looking at expanding and doing more cities in the future. We actually might be doing something in San Francisco uh, with a couple other groups in, uh, in July later this month. I'll definitely talk uh, with Jay and, um, and, and, uh, and Jeremy here uh, to follow up on that. But uh, what we did was we did exactly, I think, what you're talking about, Tony. We put together roundtable discussions, and these roundtable discussions were so that folks from different aspects of the industry all, all across the different spectrum, right? Folks that were just getting their licenses, hadn't even started the licensing process, had their licenses and were operating, uh, as well as ancillary folks that had helped stand up licenses in the past, um, all sat down at different roundtables and had discussions about what they've learned, what they've struggled with, what challenges they're having. Uh, we did focus the topics of the roundtable, so you know there was different like prompts and things of that nature. But the point is, is that that those kinds of conversations allowed folks to really be plugged in, understand what's going on, and then I think the important part 
was um, the second part of the of the day was a, uh, a, a discussion with pan with regulators. So folks from offices like Jeremy's uh, actually came to the uh, the workshop at that point and interacted and engaged with those stakeholders so that we could actually have an open conversation about this is what's needed. This is where we're at. This is what's actually happening um, at the ground level. Uh, and you know, we we in talking with regulators afterwards, we learned that that's the kind of stuff that they really could use help with because it's hard for them to organize those kinds of things. So this is where trade associations, uh, the education committee. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation, uh, piggybacking and, and catalyzing into a conversation with the education committee that Tony you sit on to see how can we further this even further, um, so that education isn't just about educating the students, but educating the regulators, educating the industry, educating everybody, uh, you know, again, in the ecosystem. Uh, Jay, I see your hand up. Uh, what do you got for us? I just wanted to follow up with what Tony said and just say yes, 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 uh, about reaching out at whatever level people are at. And I think it's why we developed our workshops through the extension. And we find that students come in at this level of like, I, I need to learn some specific skills. I don't think I'm, I don't wanna do college or the college hasn't been a place that's resonant with me. Or I had a student call me and she was like, I wanna do this, but like, I, I don't wanna do my, like, I don't wanna take statistics, you know, like, or whatever. And I was like, I get that. You, let's come, let's take you where you're at. And then we're finding a high number who start out in those workshops, learning these job skills or then saying, feeling that experience and getting that confidence, you're going, okay, I'm ready to roll into college, um, which may be, again, I, I'm actually not, <laughs> I always say to people, I'm strangely not college focused for someone who's the dean of a college, like wherever you need to be is where you need to be and, and, and go and get a job in whatever area you want to get it in. But uh, um, I think particularly in this industry and where we're at, having more people who have some degrees are going to are going to give us some credibility, whether we like it or not. That's the way it's played. But I think a lot of those students come and they just don't have that confidence level. So come in, take some of these workshops and classes, and then we're going to get you in the door. Particularly for our, our folks who have been unjustly incarcerated for work that they were doing, will come out and some don't have some skills around even computers or how to use phones or things because they've been held. And so right. now they're coming out and we're like, hey, we're going to help you with that. We're going to get you there. We're really trying to set up a center where we've got like where we can connect employers, where we can connect some 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 skills that may have been lost during some time that people were away from us. And we'll bring them back and say, hey, let's help you get get some of those skills and get you back and working with Jeremy's office and how we can do job fairs and things along those. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of babbling, but I just want to say I, I totally agree with Tony that we need to, you know, we need to reach out and meet people with their educational needs and whatever that is that may not be traditional college. Um, right. And at the same time, that may roll some people into going college can be for me. Exactly. No, I appreciate that. Uh, it brings up a question I have for, for Kevin. Before we get there, I do see Sharon's hand up. What do you got for us, Sharon? Yeah, I was just going to say, we can even roll this all the way back to me passing out flyers on the street for a free cannabis conference in the neighborhood and saying, you know, seeing someone, you know, smoking on the corner and saying, hey, would you be interested in coming to this cannabis event that we're having? Oh, cannabis, like, what's that? like right. what you have in your hand so like we can roll this all the way back in terms of reaching people where they are and i know for for daco we've provided for the last six years a free two-day cannabis conference where we bring in people like that who are on the corner to folks like our mayor and our elected officials and everyone else in between because at the end of the day these are the people that are going to make a difference in the next generations and in the future of this industry so yes we can talk about the education i mean like this is you know this is so many levels to getting this thing right unfortunately you know we're cleaning we're we're at clean up mode <laughs> so we're cleaning up what was started and and just really making sure that whatever we do that we are engaging all of these people because the language is different, the culture is different, it's all different. There are people who who are engaged in cannabis who want don't want anything to do with a, a legalized economy because they just see the games that have happened 
um, in their lives and in their families' lives. And so, and I get it. And so for me, I try to be there to say, yes, I understand, I get it, but here's this opportunity or, but here's that opportunity. So yes, we can really roll it all back. Uh, all the way back to even just the, the vocabulary that we use sometime. And so um, again, education on, on all levels. And I know for me, I really started off with, with churches, with trying to educate uh, folks in, in churches and working with that, with that group. Because I know in, in our community, if you wanna find black people, you have to go to churches. So I work with, I like to work with the churches and I like to work with our elected officials because that's, that's where, um, at least what I see that a lot of this information, because if you get the aunties and the grandmas and they say, well, that lady said this, that, and the other. So, you know, make sure you have your medical marijuana card or make sure you do this or make sure you do that. This is like, this is this is going to take a whole village to make right. this happen in the right way for us. And so making sure we go to all levels is, is key in what we do. Absolutely. No. And again, it comes back to the, the, the whole point in this conversation, the ecosystem that we're creating, right? Um, as we're talking here, the thing that really stands out to me is just how connected we all are in the work that we're doing, how similar a lot of the work that we're doing, even if it's at different spaces, different levels, because it's what's needed. And what's needed when it comes to cannabis is the destigmatization, the legitimization, the actual flow of knowledge and information, the connecting with the community, all these different pieces combined, right? Uh, you know, I, I, um, I, one of the things that, that stands out for me too, uh, when you're talking, uh, Jay, is, you know, I went to City College uh, of San Francisco um, sporadically over the course of a few years. I uh, never completed uh, my coursework fully, um, did get enough units to be able to um, go to an acupuncture school. Uh, the thing that was interesting uh, to me was, uh, you know, a lot of us that were there at City College, we were there, um, you know, at the end of the day, involved in the legacy space and the legacy market uh, for cannabis. And that was all that existed uh, regarding cannabis on campus at the time. Um, now, it's really interesting to me to see this kind of coming full circle and that we have you know, so much work to do still, but that you guys have an actual degree. Um, and so that brings me to the question that I had uh, for Kevin, actually, is Kevin, you know, you talked about meeting folks where they're at. Um, you know, and, and creating these multiple pathways, which include some folks that don't have the capacity to go through a whole entire massive program. Um, you know, the, the question I have that I want to ask you is, uh, what made you guys decide to go for accreditation in the first place? Because as we know, it's, it's a long, arduous process uh, mm -hmm. that has no guarantees at the end of it. Um, you know, you guys could have said, hey, you know, we're just going to focus on just the meeting the folks where they're at and doing these webinars or, or these seminars or things of that nature. Um, but you said, no, we're going to jump in and go full throttle with this. Why did you guys decide to go ahead and go for this accreditation in the first place? So I, I think the first thing for us was uh, my business partner and I, Tyron Russell, our current president as well, and our founder, Austin, you know, uh, Tyron and I don't come from the cannabis space. Um, you know, my legacy experience was just as, uh, you know, a consumer, um, at the end of the day. And I remember my first day, you know, on campus, to, uh, and we were starting this process of doing our first class. This is January 17, uh, January 25th of 17. And so we're about a week ahead of this and I'm sitting on campus and I'm, I'm looking at a wheel that had all these different cannabinoids and at the levels and the temperatures that you might consume them or what you combine them with and what that might aid in your wellness. And that was really my aha moment to say, okay, even though I'm embarking on this, my biases are strong. And even though I'm an advocate and have always said cannabis has not affected me with proper, you know, adult, you know, proper consumption, you know, not being just, you know, binging and on it and things of that sort. You binge on anything, it's not good for you. Um, you know, that's when I had to check myself and said, my biases are still, up, still at play, even though I'm a leader in this organization. Um, what that told me then is what's everyone else going to think that doesn't care about this industry in itself, especially when we're thinking about where we were at 2016, you know, early 2017 to compare to where we are right now. Uh, so we knew with the work that we've done in economic development, you know, working with other traditional schools, higher educations, uh, in the marketing and staff development area, working with municipalities and governments, that there was going to be a need for high standards in education. And we really wanted not only individuals, you know, um, community members, stakeholders, politicians, 
all these different areas to really look at this industry, right? We wanted people that were in the, that wanted to be in the industry to also step up their game, right? Because sometimes as well, what we've seen from the workforce is that a person thinks that because I work in cannabis, that there's not an expectation of quality, right? Uh, that a quality professionalism that you still need to come with, you know, to that. And we also looked at when our, our biggest comparison for standardization, we also know standardization is going to have to happen, right? Uh, you can't have, especially the way that our patients uh, interact, you know, with um, a uh, patient specialist, you, you don't want to have too much, too much variety out there and people talking about different things about what this medicine can provide to somebody's wellness, right? So standardization is going to be key in the future. And we look at what that looks like as a journeyman's ec electronic uh, electrician license, right? They're able, every state has different regulations per being an electrician, but the journeyman's license allows you to work across all 50 states. So we looked at that model and said, well, this is going to be the future. There's going to have to be some standardization. And the only way to do that is to start to take some of the natural progresses that our traditional educational partners, institutions have taken uh, to go ahead and validate their education. Um, and I think the biggest thing is this, um, we all, I, you know, we all hope that individuals have great intent and have the integrity to hold themselves accountable. And there's not always the best way. You have your own biases, and sometimes you think you're, you think your meal is just the best meal ever, right? Um, so what this process does is it holds us accountable to high standards. Uh, that truthfully, um, you know, we've seen that we've done a good job at that but it really continues, it continues to push us to say standards are required. We're going to push ourselves for high standards and we want our students to trust us and we want the employers to trust us. So, um, you know, we really believe that the long game um, is the game that we were playing instead of the short game of market share. Um, and we feel that's going to pay dividends, you know, for us as an organization, for the industry and for every person that stepped through the doors of CSC and will continue uh, to, to choose us. As I said, I always think about that young uh, person that we talked about earlier, right? Like young, we're doing a lot of outreach to 18 to 24, to individuals that are saying, hey, right. what does a career look like for me? And we want those individuals to be confident and we want their parents to be confident, their grandparents to be confident and support them in their journey instead of segmenting them off to say, oh, they're, you know, you know, uh, Mike is, you know, he's getting into cannabis to say, hey, Mike is going to have a, a career in cannabis. And, you know, how do we continue to support Mike or Amy or Kim in their process and moving forward? So I always think about uh, not only the students, but I also think about their families and the support you need when you're going through that biggest transition in your life. You know, the question that they ask you when you're 13, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. You know, you're trying to figure it out. So uh, we still need that support in those early years when you're, you know, when uh, the world says you're an adult now. Um, and we hope that uh, our standardization helps families say, hey, you know, we can get behind uh, this educational institution uh, to help our, our our young person, you know, be successful in life. No, I, I appreciate that a lot. Uh, the the long term thinking, I think, is so key, especially when we're talking about education, right? Um, as Jeremy mentioned earlier, sometimes you have to, to be nimble and think about what's what is needed right now by these business owners. But we also have to be thinking about the infrastructure we're building for the long term if we're going to build really a new paradigm uh, with this cannabis industry. Um, on that note. Uh, one of the things that I love about these catalyst conversations is what they catalyze outside of just this conversation itself, right? What happens down the line? I'm really hopeful that the five, six people on this call, uh, these conversations will continue offline as well as with other folks that watch this webinar, that we send this webinar to, uh, that we encourage to check out the webinar because I think that um, you know if we can find aligned folks to work with, that's gonna make life a lot easier coming down the pipeline. Um, so that said, um, you know, at the NCAA, you know, we're a trade association. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Jeremy, you know, uh, you know, having, uh, and, and this was one of the questions I posed, we posed here in the survey, right, is what can we, what should we, we be focused on? Uh, one of the responses is educating regulators and legislators. So what can we do, Jeremy, as a trade association to help with the education side of things with your office uh, and regulatory offices in general? Uh, that's great. And I almost consider this like a pilot program to this. I've been taking notes throughout this. Everyone had something really valuable to say. Um, and that point, meet folks where they're at. So social equity in San Francisco is going to look different than Cleveland to, uh, you know, Houston, so on and so forth. So programming 
um, to really understand the contours of that specific local community to tie into a broader national conversation. Someone made the point how disjointed sometimes the industry can be. Equity programs look very different across the country. There's different regulations across the country, different regulators doing different things. So all to say, I think it's um, uh, to that point, start at the soil and build upwards. Awesome, I appreciate that. Um, I know our organization has been talking with CANRA and a couple, CANRA is the Cannabis Regulators Association from around the country um, about ways that we can do exactly what you just said. How do we kind of button things up and not be so disparate, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I love that. A shout out to ASTM, a standards association that is focused on literally doing exactly that, creating standards for the industry to Kevin's point so that we're not all saying different things to Sharon's point so that when we say the word cannabis, we know what we're talking about in the first place. Uh, you know, uh, Sharon, how about yourself? Like, what, what do you think as far as what's needed down the pipe, coming down the pipeline? What are some next steps for you uh, for what you're working on? Yeah, so next steps for for me is uh, working with our our legislators because we're here in Pennsylvania where we still only have have medical and that medical program did not include uh, communities like mine. So we have been working with legislators. We just had the first uh, cannabis panel ever for the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus. And, uh, and it was well received. As a matter of fact, they, they wanna do another one uh, because they too, uh, they don't really understand the scope of this. A lot of times people who come to their offices don't look like, like us. And so they wanna make sure that uh, with this next step toward legalization for, for Pennsylvania, that what happened with the medical program doesn't happen with adult use. So for my next step is, uh, is just really working closely with the legislators so that they can understand what equitable uh, legalization and uh, looks like, because a good thing about us sort of being last in this, um, in this key, state, key state area is that we get to see what everybody else did wrong <laughs> and what everybody else did right and kind of like put that together into a platform that will eventually pass. So um, so that's important. And of course, Black Cannabis Week, which is always the last, um, the fourth week of September every year. So this is be our, our fifth year of doing this. So we're excited. So I'm kind of busy right now. Yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> um, yeah. And definitely please reach out if there's any way that we can support from the NCA side of things or anybody on this call uh, with lessons learned, things that we can provide, testimony, mm -hmm. anything for mm -hmm. the work that you're doing to educate the legislators in Pennsylvania. Uh, please reach out on that. Um, Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, Jay, what's coming up down the pipeline for CCSF's uh, cannabis program? Well, for what we, what I really would love to see is to, to work with and collaborate with other public uh, educational institutions to develop two and four year uh, academic programs. And that's really what we need as, as still the only one that's taking the viewpoint that we're taking at the two year level, we need to see more. And then also we want to see more four year schools that our students can transfer into. Um, and particularly those with, that are looking at things like land use policy, that are looking at things that, you know, that are looking at cannabis in this really broad perspective that are creating those policy, those future policy leaders um, is really important to us. And right now our students kind of finish and then where do we go from here? You know, they're hungry for information, they're hungry for knowledge, they want to transfer. And so trying to, to, to work with, you know, how can we do outreach to other institutions that are thinking about it We've got to create this. If we look at any social movement, the educational institutions have been able to provide the research to say, hey, we're not just saying these things. We've got research that can back up what we're saying. And right. so to get that, we've got to get our educational institutions. And so even places like in California and Berkeley has a, a cannabis research institute, but they don't have a cannabis degree, right? right? We've got these places that are starting but so here we are, this little, not so little, but, but two-year institutions say, get some degrees going in public education, because that provides a kind of gravitas that's, that's different. And so, um, and then you can look around and kids are tra going into college and they suddenly can take, they can take an elective. They can come in and take, they need to get their sociology credit. They can take 
the social, you know, the intro to cannabis studies and get their social credit. They may go into some other field, but they will be forever changed and think about cannabis forever differently by taking that one class. So for me, I'm really passionate about how do we get other public institutions to develop these things. Awesome. So no, that's what I'm, that's what I'm really working on. You know, the, the entrepreneurship is, is not my area, but we're, but I work really closely right. with them about how do we develop this? We've got an acre horticulture department over there, which is an acre right. of land in the middle of San Francisco that we're hoping to really develop some, some really exciting stuff. So. Oh, that'd be amazing. I definitely want to check that out when that's up and running, you know, and, and I think this segues well with uh, Tony, the, you know, same question, you know, regarding, especially the education committee at, at the NCIA, I know has been working on putting together like a list of different institutions that are working on cannabis. Um, what else do you see coming up the pipeline from you for your end? Um, from, you know, I'm a big advocate for health equity as well and education. So for me personally, um, from a wellness standpoint, I really want us to focus on not only the medical, but the wellness and the prevention of it all. And my goal is I've been boots on the ground, working with these institutions, um, city colleges to be the voice of what do you need? And here's simple education. Here's education you can digest, which will keep you coming back. And at that time, your higher your questions get a little bit uh, more. I'm for a loss for words because I know we're pressed for time. But using that to really reel them in and hear what they want, but again, building from the ground up. So I see a wellness standpoint in collaboration with that. Beautiful. I, you know, I'm all about the wellness side of things. Uh, we've worked. We've been working together on the Canvas Wellness Coalition. Some good things coming down the pipeline for that, I believe. Um, you know, Kevin, I know that you know you guys have the the accreditation that you'll be hearing about, finding out about in the next few months. So, want to give you as much positive vibes and send as much good thoughts down that. You know, not only for you guys, but for the industry as a whole. I said it before, but I really appreciate the work you guys have been doing there and grinding away doing that. Um, so, look, I, I just want to say I appreciate the hell out of this conversation today. Um, I think my takeaway really is from the NCA perspective, uh, the more that we can be a connective tissue, connective glue amongst different folks in the country, uh, they're doing this kind of work, I think the better. That's what our education committee has been working on. Um, I think that, you know, uh, yep, thank you so much with uh, putting your emails in there too. I think that's another big part of it too, be making sure we're all on the same page, all part of the same groups. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is I think that we need to make a concerted effort uh, to do the education with the regulators, the legislators. We do a lot of that already at NCA. I think that with some of the insights that we learned here today, I think we can maybe re help refine the work we've been doing even further. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that all works out. And, and the last thing I'll note is that, uh, you know, internship programs is something that I've been really uh, championing here at the organization. I think that's something that, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of members that could really use apprentices and interns. And if we're, we're creating pipelines, such as working with Sharon and the HBCU tour that you guys have been working on, I think we can really create uh, some great equity in the industry. So uh, with that all said, I just want to say, I appreciate everybody here. I'm going to hand things off to Brian in a second here to wrap things up, but I appreciate a lot of all of our, uh, our, our guests here today and looking forward to see what comes out of this. So thank you so much. And thank you everybody for attending and joining us today for this great conversation. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you, Mike, for throwing it back to close things out here. Um, and thank you, obviously, as always, for leading this conversation, developing this program specifically over the last few months. I know that we initially wanted to debut this earlier in the spring, but I think that there were some relevant updates between all of the panelists that, you know, it turned out that the, the initial delay ended up being able to talk about different parts of the process here. You were much further down the accreditation process, like you said, Kevin, and really wish you all the best of luck there. Um, it's really been great to learn more about each of the different elements of this ecosystem that all of these panelists have played. So thank you so much, Sharon, for telling us a little bit more about Black Cannabis Week, what you got going on this fall and where you see sort of the next steps in your local community as well. Great to see you as always, Jeremy. It's been, like I said in the chat, it's been great to work with you um, over the years as I've seen you develop into this leader in the cannabis space in San Francisco. So I really appreciate we were able to make one of those initial connections when you were with SSDP at volunteering at one of our conferences. So um, thank you as well, Jay and Kevin, for giving us your really vital perspectives on the ground. I'm really excited to see where this continued collaboration continues to evolve. I'm excited to potentially continue working with the Education Committee to produce another um, edition of the virtual roundtable that we conducted last year and sort of see where all of the um, work and programs that we're able to coordinate internally um, culminate with. So um, I just wanted to close things out by giving you all a quick heads up 
Um, I know that Mike mentioned ASTM earlier. I believe that they're in the middle of their yearly annual meeting taking place in Denver right now surrounding um, the D37 uh, working group that focuses specifically on cannabis. Um, Darwin Millard, a member of our Cannabis Manufacturing Committee, alongside a number of other panelists that from across our 14 different sector committees have been working on a multi-part series on minor novel and synthetic cannabinoids, which will be continuing next week. So if you are able to join us, please do follow the link that I'm about to pop in the chat room here and sign up for that session in particular. We'd love all of your all's participation with that educational programming and the remaining fourth and fifth sessions that'll be taking place later this spring and summer that are focusing on uh, <clears throat> regulatory considerations and employee considerations for health and safety in the manufacturing process. Uh, with that, thank you all so much, as always, for joining us for another Industry Essentials educational webinar. It always means the most to us here at NCIA to conduct this live educational format and programming for all of you all. So really hope that you'll continue your participation with all of these series, specifically inside of our Committee Insight series coming up and later Catalyst conversations to be scheduled throughout the year. If you haven't already, make sure that you are signed up for NCIA's newsletter that you can sign up for on the main website, um, main page of our website. And as always, we'll leave you all with this end of event credit sequence that highlights the 50 plus financial sponsors amongst our member businesses that supported all of our regional in-person networking educational events that culminated in our 11th annual Cannabis Industry Lobby Days last month. So with that, um, we look forward to seeing you again for another edition of NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinars later this summer, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.